Hi, my name is Dan, and I'm going to talk about the basics of ultrasonics and ultrasonic level measurement. Nivalco has been producing ultrasonic level transmitters for solid and liquid applications for almost 40 years. These days, devices that utilize ultrasound are commonplace. There are ultrasound cleaners, toothbrushes, repellent devices. You can find them in healthcare, but there are natural ultrasonic devices as well. For example, bats use ultrasound to locate prey and obstacles. But what exactly is ultrasound? Ultrasound is the sound with frequencies higher than the upper limit of human hearing. Still, it behaves a lot like audible sound. Ultrasonic devices operate with frequencies from 20 kHz to several gigahertz. They're used in a lot of applications like object detection, distance measurement, testing and cleaning equipment, material mixing, and even accelerating chemical reactions. Ultrasonic devices use the time of flight operating principle. They measure the time it takes for the ultrasound to travel from the sensor to the measured objects and back. The sensor emits a string of ultrasonic pulses and receives the echoes bouncing back from the target. The device processes the received echoes, selects the ones that carry relevant information, and it calculates the distance between the sensor and the measured level. Inside the device, voltage is applied to the sensor's piezo. The piezo starts to resonate and creates an ultrasonic burst which travels towards the target through the air. Then it's reflected from the surface of the target and travels back to the sensor. It hits the piezo and makes it resonate, which creates a voltage pulse and the pulse is received by the processor, which converts it into a signal. Once we know the travel time, it's easy to calculate the distance using C, the speed of sound in dry air at 20 degrees Celsius. However, the speed of ultrasound is influenced by a number of factors, for example, the medium in which the sound is traveling. Usually it's just air, but even the composition of the air makes a difference. Temperature is also an important factor, and to compensate for its effects, Nivalco puts a temperature sensor in all of their ultrasonic devices. This chart shows how much influence temperature has on the speed of sound. This is why temperature compensation is vital to ultrasonic level measurement. Reliable measurements require keeping the beam angle as narrow as possible. That is why the angle of Nivalco's ultrasonic devices is kept between 5 and 7 degrees, which offers a uniquely precise focus and deep penetration. This picture illustrates the basics of ultrasound and makes it easier to select the best device for a specific job. Number 1 stands for the full power of the sound burst. When the ultrasonic wave travels through the air, there is power loss or damping involved, which is represented by arrow 2. Arrow 3 is the signal hitting the target decreased by arrow 2, and arrow 4 is the loss suffered by the signal when being reflected from the target, resulting in the echo represented by arrow 5, which travels back to the sensor and is decreased by arrow 6 damping, resulting in arrow 7, which is the echo arriving at the sensor. Arrow 2 and 6 may be caused by gas or vapor above liquids or dust above solids, while arrow 4 is caused by foam on liquids or solids with an uneven surface or low density. While the target is close to the device, it provides a clear echo, but as the target gets further away, the echo diminishes, and after a while it gets so weak that the sensor is unable to pick it up. The green dotted line is the theoretical curve indicating the signal level when there is no damping at all. As soon as a damping factor like air or other gas is introduced, we get a curve like the blue one. The longer the signal has to travel, the weaker the echo gets. Damping depends on various factors like the physical properties of the atmosphere above the medium or the frequency of the device. Humidity, the concentration of water vapor in the air, is a major damping factor. Another significant damping factor is the temperature of the atmosphere in which the signal is traveling. The blue curve in this diagram illustrates the signal dampened by clean air, and the green line is the insensitive zone where the echo is so weak that the device is unable to catch it. The theoretical maximum measuring distance of a device is where the echo lever first hits the insensitive zone. The safety zone is in which the device can measure reliably and whose maximum we call the nominal measuring range. Additional damping factors may reduce the device's maximum measuring range. Therefore, it is vital to know the physical properties of the measuring medium and the environment before purchasing a system. We have discussed the maximum measuring range, 
but there's a minimum measuring range as well. The dead zone, within which measuring is not possible, is the distance covered by the sound waves during the time of the ultrasound burst, indicated as T-burst, and the ring out time, during which the burst fades out. Sensor alignment is crucial for distance measuring devices. It works exactly like a mirror. If the transmitter is set up so the beam travels at an angle too wide and the signal bounces back to a point outside the sensor area, the device will not be able to catch the echo. If the transmitter is misaligned, the echo may not even register, while an echo from a correctly aligned transmitter produces a massive spike. When there are multiple damping factors, correct alignment becomes even more important. Aiming in solid applications is just as crucial. While liquids may produce fumes, they still have an inherently smooth surface to measure. On the other hand, bulk solids usually have an uneven and inhomogeneous surface, producing a lot of scattering, so proper sensor alignment is critical. In solid applications, the echo is usually a lot weaker compared to liquids, therefore it is far more unforgiving when it comes to aiming, given that the increased scattering further weakens the echo. As the aiming of the device improves, so does the signal and the measurements itself. Device placement is another critical element of an accurate and reliable system. Selecting the transmitter's locations requires knowing all the significant parameters of an application inside and out. The device must be placed offset from the center and the side of the container and away from the filling nozzle, loading hole, beams and other objects that may damage the instrument or interfere with the measurements. The transmitter must be protected from the sun and the weather, as precipitation and direct sunlight may damage the device. As long as there are no interfering objects and the device is placed and aligned correctly, measurements will be accurate and reliable. If the medium is stirred vigorously, it causes the surface to ripple and it might interfere with the measurements. Foaming on the surface is another phenomenon that makes measuring with ultrasonic devices difficult. If the foam is thin, the signal will go through it as if it wasn't there. But the thicker the foam gets, the harder it is for the ultrasound to penetrate it, and it may diminish the signal so much that it becomes too weak to be detected. The use of standpipes is generally unfavorable. If, however, it becomes necessary to use one, they must comply with the dimensional and geometrical requirements to avoid problems in measurement. The pipe's diameter must be at least the size specified for the particular device and the inside of the pipe must be rounded to avoid any echoes reflecting from its surface. This concludes the introduction to ultrasonic basics. Thank you for watching. The presentation was compiled by Agnes Genesh and we hope it will help you choose the right device.